This video brought to you by our two executive producers, Cosmosor and Tom Dolan. Thank you. All right, let's get back into this media theory thing. Let's go. We covered more of the analytical portions of media theory in the last few parts. So I think it's time we looked at something more structural because it's all well and good being able to read, interpret and discuss the themes of a piece. But if those themes aren't presented with any structure, then it's all just going to be a big blob of ideas. It's the structure and the presentation of these ideas, which is something that we call narratology, that enable the reader to interpret it in the first place. Now, there are a million different theorists with a million different narrative structures, and we're going to start with some of the more simple, simple ones. And if you like this area of the media, then you can feel free to dive into the narratology ocean, but this is the paddling pool. And joining me in the paddling pool is Zvetan Todorov which I've definitely pronounced wrong. Svetan Tardarov was a Bulgarian French historian, literary critic and essayist who lived from 1939 to 2017. And as you can imagine, he saw a lot of shit in that time. But the thing that is most important to us right now is the essay that he wrote for Novel, a forum on fiction in 1969. Nice. This essay was titled Structural Analysis of a Narrative, and it posited that every story, every narrative, every play, film, book, anything could be broken down into five broad steps. These five steps are equilibrium, disequilibrium, acknowledgement, solving, and finally, equilibrium again. Now you know the drill by now. We're going to drill down into these one by one with a couple of examples to explain it a bit more clearly. So step one is equilibrium. This is the starting point for the world as we enter the piece. We'll take a typical sitcom episode as an example, right? Because as much as every story follows these beats, the sitcom makes them the easiest to see. We'll look at an episode of Bob's Burgers because I've already made my feelings towards that show very, very clear. So every story in Bob's Burgers opens in pretty much the same way. The family are in the restaurant or upstairs in their house. The family all work together and they all get along well. It's, well, the equilibrium. There's no work conflict in the world of the show except for the long-standing and therefore normal ones, as such as the rivalry between Bob and Jimmy Pesto. Equilibrium is the world as you expect to see it, or in a new setting, a world in which the characters expect it. The second phase is the disequilibrium, which as you can probably guess is something that disturbs the equilibrium. In the episode Glued Where's My Bob, which is one of my favourite episodes of the show, the disequilibrium happens when Bob gets himself glued to the toilet seat. As you can probably guess if you haven't seen the, the episode, this is quite the equilibrium shift as not only is he the main chef of the restaurant, he also has an interview with the prestigious food magazine Coasters planned for that day. Third phase is the acknowledgement, in which the characters recognise that there has been a disturbance in the equilibrium. Obviously this happens almost immediately in this example, since a man is stuck to a toilet, but but the effects of this are seen in the next few scenes where they call in a bunch of people to help, but Jimmy Pesto finds out and tries to humiliate him, and a musical number happens. Because it's Bob's Burgers, of course a musical number happens. The fourth phase, solving, is, well, trying to solve the problem. In this example, this is where they try and remove Bob from the toilet he is stuck to while also trying to reschedule the interview and then get him as looking as good as they can for it. This culminates in the hilarious antics that you might think for an animated sitcom before the photographers arrive. Once they arrive and begin to leave, the problem is truly solved once the patrons of the restaurant rally around Bob and he finally gets up off the toilet. And finally, we come to equilibrium. Now, this phase can take one of two forms. Either the show returns to its old equilibrium, which is the case for most traditional sitcoms, or the new equilibrium. For example, in the movie Brave, which has the new equilibrium of less warring clans and a better relationship between Merida and her mother, Bob's Burgers has a return to the old equilibrium, as by the end of the episode, he still hates Jimmy, they all still work in the restaurant, the only thing that has changed is he got one good review, but that is forgotten by the beginning of the next episode. Now again, this is just an example from a sitcom because that is the genre that so obviously pins itself to this theory. However, with a little bit of finagling, you can get pretty much any narrative to fit into this five stage model. In fact, homework for this episode is pick your favorite movie and divide its plot into the five stages of the Todorov method. Or, you know, just comment and tell me I look nice today algorithm and all that. I also want to talk about the hero's journey, which is another incredibly applicable, albeit way more detailed way of narrative structure. In fact, the hero's journey might need a video of its own, but to briefly go over it here, there are 17 stages, as you can see here, that basically outline the majority of any stories you can think of that have an obvious single main character. Obviously, things like ensemble casts like community can't really apply to this, but within this series, you can find hero's journeys for single characters over single episodes, or series arcs. The hero's journey can be organized into three main parts or acts known as the departure, the initiation and the return. In the departure part of the narrative, the hero or protagonist lives 
on the ordinary world and receives a call to go on an adventure. The hero is reluctant to follow the call, but is helped by a mentor figure. The initiation section begins with the hero then traversing the threshold to an unknown or special world, where he faces tasks or trials, either alone or with the assistance of helpers. The hero eventually reaches the innermost cave, or the central crisis of his adventure, where he must undergo the ordeal, where he overcomes the main obstacle or enemy, undergoing apotheosis and gaining a reward. The hero must then return to the ordinary world with his reward. He may be pursued by the guardians of the special world, or he may be reluctant to return, and may be rescued or forced to return by intervention from the outside. In the return part of the narrative, the hero again traverses between the thresholds between worlds, returning to the ordinary world with the treasure or elixir that he gained, which he may now use for the benefit of his fellow man. The hero himself is transformed by the adventure and gains wisdom or spiritual power over both worlds. Finally, I want to talk about the work of Claude Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss looked at narrative specifically in myth as a way of understanding culture. He found it odd that many cultures around the world have similar myths and broke each of them down into beats that he called mythemes. Levi Strauss suggested everyone thinks of the world around them in terms of binary opposites, such as up and down, life and death, etc., and therefore every culture can be understood in those terms. Binary opposition is used to create narrative and to create conflict in myths, and more recently, in the media. It's also used to simplify complex situations for easy consumption, for example, mainstream news simplifying a story into good guy and bad guy. Along similar lines, if something is not easily reduced to binary opposites, it is far less likely to receive widespread media. Media coverage. But binary oppositions can be used to create stereotypes and promote certain ideologies or beliefs. Let's return again to that good guy versus bad guy narrative and see how it is used to create media narratives that can be damaging, for example in police fiction. Shows such as CSI or Law and Order have a very clear good and evil binary opposition in which the police officers are the good guy and the criminal is the bad guy, which has a problem on two fronts. Firstly, it continues to push the copaganda narrative of all cops being good and cops in general being a good thing. And secondly, both shows delve into different smaller subcultures such as jugglers, furries, congoers, ravers, inevitably having a member of that subculture fulfilling the bad guy role. This blanket paints the subculture as the bad guy, with the exception being those that help the cops, which as I just outlined, promotes copaganda. Binary oppositions can be a helpful tool to begin a narrative, but without exploration and nuance can lead to harmful messaging, bad stereotyping, and dull stories. And the same can be said about all narrative devices. When I taught this in school, it was understanding of not only why these things are being used, but the effects they have on the reader, both at the time of reading and further on in their life that got the high marks, rather than simply describing them. So when I tell you these things, I'm not doing it as a way to deride the techniques or ward you away from them, but simply to identify them and see how they're being used to create stories, but also to promote ideologies, either consciously or not. If you're wanting to create media, by all means, utilize these ideas, but be careful of the messaging you're creating while using them. And if you're not a creator, well, at the very least, you'll be able to predict the endings of movies more often now. And thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please do click the like and subscribe buttons below, leave a comment if you've got something to say, and check out the other videos of mine on screen for more of me. And a huge thank you to all of the patrons scrolling up the screen right now, and a massive thank you to the fresh cheese bags of the month. Alex Bryson, Clouds Haberberg, Ethan Saffron, Horse of Many Names, Carl Rod, Logan Myers, Malloy, The Magpie Magus, Neurotic Anarchy, Swishy Clang, and What Would Jedi Do? And a massive, massive thank you to the executive producers of this month, Tom Dolan and Cosmosaur. Thank you and love you bye.